Hello, my name is Leon Defulgenis. I am a member of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and today I will be giving a presentation on the history of the United States Coast Guard and the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. I'm going to start off this presentation talking about the most famous and notorious lifesaver, Joshua James, America's Sea Captain and U.S. Life Saving Station Keeper. Joshua James was born November 22, 1826, in Hull, Massachusetts. On April 3, 1837, at the age of 10, Joshua James witnessed a pivotal event in his life. He was an eyewitness to the death of his mother and baby sister in a shipwreck and sinking in Hull Gut, only a half a mile from Safe Harbor. From that point on, he made a promise that he would save as many lives as possible from shipwreck. James was credited with saving over 500 lives from the age of 15 when first associated with the Massachusetts Humane Society until his death at the age of 75, while on duty with the Life Saving Service. James was a recipient of the Gold Life Saving Medal awarded by the U.S. government. The dramatic death of Joshua James occurred on March 19, 1902. During a rigorous training exercise, James was performing a drill with his boat crew. Upon grounding the boat, he sprang onto the sand glanced at the sea and stated the tide is ebbing, then fell dead on the beach from a heart attack. Famous last words, remarkable that he was still going out on rescues at the age of 75. He lived about as arduous and remarkable a life as one possibly could. Also pictured on the slide is the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter James, which was the fifth national security cutter and was named in honor of Joshua James' life and dedication to saving lives. The Coast Guard also created the Joshua James Ancient Keeper Award to honor the Coast Guard personnel with the most seniority in rescue work and the highest record of achievement. This is a picture of uh, the very early days of life saving. And as you can see from the picture, the surfmen wore oil skins, boots, cork life vests, and used very basic surf boats. You fast forward to today, and the Coast Guard relies on survival suits, helmets, motor life rescue boats, helicopters, and advanced navigational tools to perform rescues. The earliest beginnings of the Coast Guard was born in 1790. It traced its roots to a small fleet of vessels maintained by the United States Department of the Treasury. Originally, it was referred to as the Revenue Marine, and then it was officially renamed the Revenue Cutter Service. Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton lobbied Congress to create a fleet of 10 large ships, or cutters, to enforce tariffs on vessels entering U.S. ports. Under the enabling legislation, the system of cutters, consisting of 10 vessels, were initially ordered and constructed. On August 4, 1790, this is what today we celebrate as the U.S. Coast Guard's official birthday. A cutter vessel is a small or medium-sized boat sailing ship built for speed and with a shallow draw. The keel is not far below the water line. This is helpful in navigating in shallow waters. Larger cutters had two or three masts, but many had only one, located more centrally on the ship. The service gradually gained missions, which were voluntary or authorized by legislation under the authority of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Trade by sea was increasing, and tariffs were an important source of revenue for the new nation. National income was desperately needed. The government determined that a great deal of this income would come from tariffs on imports. In modern times, any naval coast guard ship built for agility and speed is still referred to as a cutter. Cutters were assigned from Georgia to Massachusetts. Between 1790 and 1798, the Revenue Marine was the only armed maritime service of the United States. The Revenue Cutter Service thus served as the Navy until 1794. Congress passed the Naval Act of 1794, authorizing the construction of six heavy frigates, the first ships of the U.S. Navy. The United States Life Saving Service was a United States government agency that grew out of private and local humanitarian efforts to save the lives of shipwrecked mariners and passengers. Formed in 1848 and ultimately merged with the Revenue Cutter Service to form the U.S. Coast Guard in 1915. 
The concept of assistance to shipwrecked mariners from shore base stations began with volunteer life-saving services. Originally, this was spearheaded by the Massachusetts Humane Society. It recognized that only small boats stood a chance in assisting those close to the beach. Larger sailing ships stood a good chance of running aground. These early stations, just like the one pictured here, were small shed-like structures holding rescue equipment that was used by volunteers in case of a wreck. These early stations, however, were only near approaches to busy port ports. Thus, large gaps of coastline remained without life-saving equipment. This is a picture of the Indian River Delaware life-saving station. Formal federal involvement in the life-saving business began on August 14, 1848, with the signing of the Newell Act. This act was named for its chief advocate, New Jersey Representative William A. Newell. Under this act, the United States Congress appropriated $10,000 to establish unmanned life-saving sta stations along the New Jersey coast. The stations of service fell into three categories, life-saving, lifeboat, and houses of refuge. Some of these stations were manned with full-time crews when the wrecks were more likely. On the East Coast, this was usually from April until November, the active season. Also in 1848, the Massachusetts Humane Society received funds from Congress for life-saving stations on the Massachusetts coastline. This is a picture of the Ocean City Maryland life-saving station, uh, and now it's currently a museum. On January 28, 1915, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Act to Create the Coast Guard, merging the life-saving service with the Revenue Cutter Service to create the U.S. Coast Guard. In 1939, the U.S. Lighthouse Service also merged with the Coast Guard. At this time, there was a network of 270 stations covering the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico Coast, and the Great Lakes. This is a picture that I took of the lightship Overfalls, which is located in Lewis, Delaware. You move forward to World War II, and the U.S. Coast Guard and the Auxiliary both had a uh, pivotal role that they both played in, in that war. Uh, this is a picture of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Escanaba, which was deployed to participate in the Battle of the Atlantic. It was struck by either a torpedo or mine in the early morning of June 13, 1943, while serving as a convoy escort. Only two survivors of her 105-man crew were found on the surface by her rescuers. This is a picture of the 1942 Matacanal River on Guadalcanal Island uh, engagement, which was in the southwestern Pacific. The U.S. Coast Guard was credited with the evacuation of U.S. Marines during the engagement. During World War II, many auxiliaries became temporary members of the Coast Guard Reserve. This is a picture of the picket patrol, which was during World War II. And the Coast Guard Reserve Act in 1939 was passed by Congress, creating a civilian reserve force for the U.S. Coast Guard. In 1941, Congress restructured the law created just two years earlier. This split the reserve and auxiliary forces. Existing civilian organization renamed the Coast Guard Auxiliary. The Coast Guard Reserve was created that year and would have military and law enforcement responsibilities. During World War II, auxiliaries helped the Coast Guard with training and recruiting active duty personnel. The Corsair Fleet, similar to the one pictured here, was a large number of vessels owned and piloted by auxiliarists. Some crews were also made up of Coast Guard reservists. This made up the bulk of American coastal anti-submarine warfare capability. The auxiliary is credited with the rescue of hundreds of survivors of torpedoed merchant ships during World War II. 1942, through the remainder of the war, auxiliaries and reservists served on port security forces to protect the shipping industry. In 1996, Congressional legislation passed that expanded the auxiliary, auxiliary's role to allow members to assist in any Coast Guard mission except for law enforcement and military operations. Auxiliary supports missions on the water or in the air. For the first time since World War II, the Coast Guard Auxiliary lended operational support to the U.S. Coast Guard in protecting coastlines, ports, 
and citizens against foreign attacks due to the tragic events of September 11, 2001. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina, 76 Coast Guard and Auxiliary aircraft took part in rescues. 42 cutters and 131 small boats also participated. 33,545 total lives were saved after this disaster. Today's U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. The U.S. Coast Guard is a maritime military multi-mission service unique among U.S. military branches for having a maritime law enforcement mission with jurisdiction of domestic and international waters. It operates under the U.S. Department of Homeland Security during peacetime, transferred to the U.S. Department of the Navy, or by the U.S. President at any time, or U.S. Congress during times of war. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary today, there are 26,000 members, 825 units, 1,800 vessels, 160 aircraft, 1,400 radio facilities, and 3.8 million hours per year in support of the United States Coast Guard. Every year, auxiliaries help to save approximately 500 lives, assist 15,000 distressed boaters, conduct over 150,000 safety examinations of recreational vessels, and provide boater safety education to over 500,000 students. I would like to thank you for watching this presentation. If you are interested in joining the auxiliary, please visit the website for the auxiliary, www.cgaux.org. Thank you.